Welcome to Felony Miami, where real people have real conversations about justice right here in America. What is justice, and who does it serve? In the criminal justice system, murderers sometimes walk free after 12 to 15 years in prison, while low-level drug offenders can go away for life. Two different killers with two different lawyers can get two different sentences. Why? Is Lady Justice blind? Some people wish the punishments were more extreme. Others say they're too harsh. What do you think? Today on Felony Miami, we dive deep into the inner workings of prosecution and defense. We welcome an ex-felon who successfully had his rights restored and a former prosecutor who recognizes that prosecutors are overworked, underpaid, and subject to the whim of whatever judge they stand before. This system does not exist in a vacuum. It's made up of people and the conditions that they face as they determine the fate of those who they try or choose not to. Where there's injustice for one, there is injustice for all. Welcome to Felony Miami. Let's air it out. Hello and welcome back to Felony Miami. I'm your host, Joe Stone. And on today's program, we have three guests. Once again, we have Dr. B, Dr. Bernard Ashby, cardiologist of uh, Columbia University professor, hip-hop entrepreneur with FDF Global, and record label tech startup that uh, invests in local talent, and uh, oh, they also have a professional recording studio over there in Wynwood, and you're helping out a lot of young youngsters from, uh, from the projects with, with uh, their legal problems as well. Thank you. Welcome to the program. Pleasure to be here. All right. Also, we have Denise Georges, former state assistant attorney from Miami-Dade County from 2008 to 2016. Ms. Georges developed a valuable skill set in victim advocacy and tried over 40 jury trials all the way to verdict and also was involved in over 50 bench trials. In addition, as a felony division chief, Ms. Georges tried a multitude of cases, including murder and DUI manslaughter. That's heavy stuff. In April 2016, Ms. Georges joined the law firm of Colson Hicks Edson, where she represents clients who have been catastrophically injured as a result of medical negligence. Welcome to the program. Honored to be here. Thank you so much. And Denise is also uh, affiliated with FDF. She oh, actually all right. did some pro, pro bono work for some of our artists, and uh, you know her expertise went a long way in uh, giving them the, a fair shot. Awesome. Awesome. We appreciate that. The community appreciates that. Mm -hmm. And we also have Mr. Leroy Jones, who is the founder of NANA, the Neighbors and Neighbors Association, uh, a coalition of, of business to strengthen the black community politically and economically, which since 1995 has recruited, trained, and placed residents into current jobs. He's also uh, part of the Circle of Brotherhood, community organizers that assist and help people in the community to, uh, to, to create a better life for themselves. So on today's program, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Last show, we talked about felony disenfranchisement. And one of the things that we were missing was somebody that had gone through the process of being convicted of a felony and getting their rights restored. And we are very fortunate today because Mr. Leroy Jones went through this process of getting his rights restored. And we are eager to hear you tell us how you did it. Wow. So after 18 years of trying to get my rights restored, um, I was successful in uh, getting a hearing in front of the governor in the cabinet that listened to uh, people that are trying to get their uh, uh, civil liberties restored and clemency. Um, just a few months ago, um, I went, in, went to Tallahassee and uh, was granted my hearing. Um, I'll tell you this, the paperwork to apply to get it to 
have them consider it wasn't difficult at, at all. I was able to do it myself. But the process to get there was, um, took a lot of time, um, back and forth. So they, they assign you this investigate, investigator that go back to even if you sped on the sidewalk, they know. So everything I've done from every parking ticket, um, every time I was arrested, all of that, uh, even back into juvenile stages. And they call you and they do this two-hour interview where they ask you a lot of questions. So a lot of it is them asking you the same questions over and over to see if you're going to say something different. That's the way I felt. Mm-hmm. When you get the letter saying that you're going through the process, there's some questions on there. I think, well, it bothered me because it didn't have anything to do with your rights being restored. I'll give you an example. It was a question there about having HIV, and I didn't understand why, some, you know, what that would do to someone that had HIV or had AIDS. Would that discourage them for going through the process? Well, I went through the process, filled out the paperwork, um, maybe a year of back and forth going, answering questions, um, uh, getting uh, additional information, them wanting to know uh, things that I own, things I was doing. It was, it was enough to make uh, the average person like say, you know, it ain't worth it. But to me, based on all the things I've done since my last incarceration, I was determined to see it through the end. Um, um, I feel strongly that uh, all the things I've done warrant me the opportunity to vote. Uh, What's so funny, though, (laughs) two weeks before Obama's first election, I got a voter's registration card to vote. I went and voted. Two weeks after I voted, I got a letter from the election department saying, you did not have the right to vote. I said, well, y'all sent me a voter's card. Right. (laughs) True story. Um, So I get to the clemency hearing, and at the clemency hearing, it's an open forum. So it's not like they see each individual in a room, ask questions. Everybody that comes for the hearing on that day, it's my understanding they have about four or five clemency hearings a year. How many people were in the room? Uh, it was maybe a hundred and some odd people trying to get their trying rights to back. get either their rights back or get pardoned. Yeah. Oh, so people that are currently serving time trying to get pardoned, or people that people that no, probation. Sir, it, well, people that's that's um. Well, they're not serving time. I think it's called pardon. Well, it's likely that they've already been. They already convicted did convicted of, a crime. of time. And they're trying to get it wiped off totally. Oh, like so, sealed or no pardon? No, just pardon. So yeah. that pardon. no pardon. Your yeah. entire conviction would just be right. vacated. Be vacated. Oh, okay. Right. So oh, that it, so there's a difference between pardoned and clemency. Yeah, it's a it's a difference between giving your rights, get, having your rights restored, mm-hmm. being pardoned, mm-hmm. and to carry a concealed weapon. So all three of those uh, was being heard at this, at this on same the same day time. with 150 yeah, people day. in the room. About 140. And does each person get up and tell their story? Or? So the way they go is, um, you have to be there at a certain time. I think it starts at 12 o'clock. Now, I want to tell you, they started on time. And so it's the governor, it's the... Um, the, the, the actual governor. The attorney general, the governor himself. Yeah, there? At the yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, wow. So it's three people that serve on the board. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but in this state, the governor cannot pardon on his own, right? It takes a it take right. He can't do it on his own. It takes a committee Mm -hmm. to do it, Um, and they try to get all four of the committee members to approve it, but of course, three can do it. Um, So, I think I'm like number eighty something, and so I get to hear every case before me. And what they do is, they do their review, and let me tell you, they was organized, so. You can, as the people was called up, it was certain convictions that they was talking about. Uh-huh. And, and I'm sure it's the convictions that they thought would not warrant you to get in your rights restored or being able to carry a firearm or get pardoned. And so listening to it, the first case was pretty long because I guess everybody trying to get into the field of it, the cabinet trying to get in the field of it. Mm-hmm. But I can honestly say this. On my way driving up, I decided to drive because I wanted to think about 
the things that I thought that they would talk to me about to try to keep me from getting my righteous thought. And it was a totally different thing than what I expected. Isn't it always the conversation in your head is one thing and then reality is... So... (laughs) That's a a lot of life, isn't it? So it it was totally organized. (laughs) Yeah. And from 12 to the time I left, it took one five-minute break. Oh, wow. And I'm going to tell you what amazed me about the whole thing, that they allow everybody to speak as long as they want to speak. No time limit. I'm telling you. So at first, when they started off, they said, well, we're going to give this amount of time for you to speak, but they didn't. After the first one, they like, they didn't do it. So it was amazing to how everybody who, and, but not only that, when they talked about the your convictions that they had a problem with, they allowed you to give an explanation. Okay. Why you thought you shouldn't have been found guilty or, or what was your rationale of you being put in that situation. So let me ask you a question. So it was different than being like in a courtroom when you went to court and you were being tried for the crime. But it was kind of this uh, well, interesting you, opportunity to be able to say, hey, here's what really happened. Because in court, you can't really do that, can you? Right. So you wasn't being retried, but right. they was asking you uh, about the issue well, why did that happen or what happened? Tell me about it. And they allowed you to speak as long as you wanted to, to, to defend yourself or defend what happened. And I didn't expect that. I really didn't. Um, so you hadn't prepared for those questions. Well, did you have the answers for them? Well, I, 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 I prepared. I picked the questions that I knew. The, the, the convictions I had yes. that I felt in my heart it was going to bring up, and I was right. So the two that they brought up was the two that um, I had planned. I thought they was going to bring up. Uh, so the first one was I was um, arrested for um, an incident I had with a store owner who said that I trashed his store and threatened him. And so they arrested me. The final outcome was it wasn't none of me. So I had been in the store before that. Some people, hours later, had a problem with the same people and had an issue with them. So in in the report that the police report wrote down, the police mentioned that I did say I was there and that all the witnesses say I wasn't there when that happened. So... That was an issue that that was an issue they they brought up because they said that I caused a lot of damage in the store and it was only me and come to find out it was a bunch of people that didn't have nothing to do with me I wasn't around but I got arrested for it went to court case got thrown out but that was one of the issues that they brought up. So and they so actually I was questioned to, you about a case about that was thrown that, out, right. just that you were arrested on, right? Not convicted. Right. Okay. Right. But that was one of the cases they brought, and I knew they was going to bring it up because it was a violent crime case. Okay, sure. I'm happy they did because it allowed me to give my side of the story of what happened. And they were satisfied with your explanation? they said, well, I got my my righteous story. (laughs) That's a good point. (laughs) So what I noticed was, I'm going to give a few things. What I actually wrote a letter to the governor's office and everybody that served in the cabinet, and I told them what I thought about the how the day planned out. So one of the things I do know is wrong is that it's like seven, eight 800,000 people that's waiting, trying to get their rights restored in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. And for them to have a hearing only four or five times a year is unfair. And based on the time period, they can only see maybe 100 or so people each one of those times. So they'll never meet the, the, the numbers that they right. need to meet. Well, this uh, last week, this is a big issue in the news right now. Um, one of the judges ordered Governor Scott... Uh, cabinet to create a system for restoring felons' voting rights. So that was just in this last uh-huh. week, I think. Well, it, it's supposed to so, be. It's supposed to be on uh, an item on the next election uh, coming up. Yeah, it is. Where people can vote ballot. to do that. Yeah. So I want to talk about my second case they brought okay. up. Okay. Okay. So the second case they brought up was with me and a city of Miami police officer. So I got a permit to demonstrate a construction site that was in the in a city that didn't have nobody that live in the inner city working on that project. And uh, uh, my intent was to get people that live there 
as well to work on that project because they receive government money to do it. So fortunately, or unfortunately, the sergeant who gave us the permit gave us the permit to be on the construction site to demonstrate. And so we get there, we got our, our permit to demonstrate, and the the officers there, the men officers there didn't give us a hard time, but the, this police officer lady came and she said, no, y'all can't demonstrate. We're showing her the permit, all this and that. So, come to, well, push come to shove, I get arrested. And so I get to the police station. Everybody knew who I'm is. Of course, they don't take me off in handcuffs because they know who I'm is and um, everybody know me and all that. So they take me back to the demonstration site because they realize the permit gave us the right to be there. But in the police report, they wrote in the police report that I threatened the police lady and I pushed her against the police car. Oh. They didn't know someone was filming the whole thing. Uh-huh. So 4 o'clock that night, they realized, they got word that somebody was filming it. They went to the people's house to get the, the recording, but the people had already gave it to me. So I didn't know they was filming it until later that afternoon. Mm-hmm. They contacted somebody that knew me, met me, gave me the recording. And so when it goes to trial, the the prosecutor wants to see the videotape. And the judge said to the prosecutor, well, why do you need to see the videotape? And say, well, we don't want to get shanghaied in court. We need to see what to say. Well, the judge said, well, that's the police officer. If she was telling the truth, you don't need to see what's on the tape. You can see it at trial. Why do you need to see what's on the tape now? If she telling the truth about it, if he pushed her, then we'll see it if, if the videotape shows it. All right. Well, I, I'm looking at you right now mm-hmm. because if I was that prosecutor mm-hmm. and there was exculpatory evidence out there in order to disprove the crime, mm-hmm. I would want it for a multitude of reasons. We already know that our criminal justice system is overburdened mm-hmm. and there are cases that need to go to trial and especially in this county where you have thousands of cases in any given division and everyone wants closure to their case. Mm-hmm. So as a prosecutor, if there was exculpatory evidence, I would want to see it for two reasons. Okay. One, mm-hmm. to dismiss the charge if that's warranted. And then number two, to bring it to internal affairs or the superiors so then they can go and investigate these police officers who may or may not have falsified a police report Mm -hmm. instead of trial by surprise. And, you know, one of those that like, we'll just wait until the last minute and then just surprise someone. All of it can be remedied on the front end if it's just turned over. Okay. So I didn't ask for discovery, nor did they ask for discovery. That's the first thing. The second thing is I get your point about what, if the police falsified or said something wrong, what should have happened? But the judge said to them, are you ready to go to trial? More than once. So they kept postponing it, postponing it, postponing it, until the judge said, no more postponed. We're going to trial this afternoon. Just get ready. They dismissed the charges. They didn't want to. They didn't want to pursue it. So... They didn't ask for so discovery. They didn't, see the, they didn't see the video, they but didn't they ended up dismissing discovery? the case anyway. Right. So you right. didn't get, you didn't even no. waste another day on yeah. that because I, I, I get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. That, that why, why carry on when there's so many people start backed up in a line? Why would you why waste, waste any time? Anyone's yeah. time? Yeah, exactly. Florida is one of two states in the United States that allows discovery in criminal cases. So what's the other state? I'm I believe, sorry. I <laughs> believe it's spot. Nevada. Okay. And I may be wrong about that, but that's why it takes on average about two to three years for an actual case to go to trial. On homicides, you're talking anywhere between five to seven years. Wow. And it really, really depends on the judges. But at the end of the day, they don't want to push a case to trial and it just be reversed for a defendant's failure to actually investigate their case. Interesting. So yeah. that is the difference between Florida and everywhere else. And plus, you know, we live in the sunshine. So everything that police do, all of the reports, as long as it's not a pending investigation, you can merely just send an email or a written request to the entity and everything is an open book. Really? That's fascinating. I didn't know that Florida had uh, 
this rule, the one of the only two states that could do discovery. And can you just tell us real quick what discovery is since you both brought it up? Mm -hmm. So discovery is where defendants are entitled to take depositions of all listed witnesses. They have an opportunity to review all of the evidence that has been impounded in the matter. They're also entitled to do any independent testing if it's DNA or fingerprint evidence and have an independent expert review it. So this all takes time. And in order for a prosecution to call a witness, they have to list everyone who may have some knowledge. So it can be anywhere from 10 witnesses on a simple case or on a complicated homicide. It can be 200 witnesses. In federal court, you're limited to 10 depositions per side in civil cases. Whereas in state criminal cases, a defense attorney can take 100 depositions if they so please. So I didn't have to request discovery because I had to tape. And right. the tape proved what happened. So when you look at the tape, the police officer affronted me and she pushed me against the car. So everything that they said in the report was not accurate. What's so, it? I guess the point like that where we want to get at is that how, how long of a process it was for you to actually get your, your voters' rights back in our current years. system. 18 years. Like 18 and, years. And, and basically the, the, the question is, you know, why, why do we even have that? Like, why, why, do we, why do we, as, as a state, take the rights of, of ex-felons, the, the right to vote away from ex-felons? So, and and is, is that serving any purpose other than disenfranchisement of an entire group, group of people? That, that could be the only case yeah. because there's some states that are supposed to be more biased or racist than Florida that allow people to get their rights restored as soon as they come off of restitution yeah. or mm -hmm. serve or their probation, time or yeah. probation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the state of Florida don't yeah. do Well, that, I, think, so. I, th I think, you know, we, Florida's on the right track. And again, Florida's one of only four states in, in the United States that still does disenfranchise felons. But I, I think it's, uh, it's going to change. I mean, I'm hopeful. Yeah. I think it's going to change because I think... It's we, on uh, the ballot come It's on the ballot November. come November. So make sure you get out there and vote. Yeah. Uh, it's super important. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to have a conversation because I'm very interested in kind of explaining this this system and how this criminal justice system here in Miami uh, works. And Denise, you have a very unique perspective on this, working in the prosecutor's office for so long. Bernard, so do you, and helping a lot of these young men that go through this process. And... Um, it seems that uh, a felony conviction is, is, in a lot of ways, a life sentence because uh, up until now and maybe when the rules change after November, um, housing is a difficult thing to acquire. Um, loans, um, uh, education, uh, th these things, uh, they, they are, it's, a, it's a huge stigma. Yeah. If you have to yeah. fill out that you're it's a like felon, a a citizen, yeah. yeah, you become a citizen. It seems that they're being handed out so quickly. And Denise, I'm curious from your perspective, working in the prosecution office, did you see a lot of like bullshit felonies being handed out or... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to qualify your term bullshit. Um, clearly, you have differing levels of felonies. So, right. you know, you have a simple cocaine possession that is a felony in the third degree. And then you have burglaries that are felonies in the second degree. And then you have sexual batteries that are felonies in the first degree. So you definitely have different levels. But let me give you an example that driving while license suspended if you have three or more convictions of a misdemeanor, the next time you are caught driving with a suspended license, you are now a habitual traffic offender, which carries a maximum of five years in prison. And this is a mere traffic offense. And, you know, here in Miami, just based on the population, the number of cases, I would say that our prosecutor's office reviews every case and has a lot more discretion than other counties. A driving while license suspended here is credit for time served. You go up to Broward County, there's a good chance that you're going to be doing a year in a day 
in prison. Now explain that year and a day thing, because I've heard that said before. There's, what, there's a differentiation between 365 days and 366 days. So clearly we have 365 days in the year. Yes. However, you can never sentence anyone to an actual year. You either have to sentence them to 364 days and they stay local. However, depending on the severity of the case, if you get 366, that means a prison number. And it doesn't matter if you have served all of your time here locally for sentencing purposes, you have gone to prison. They will fax over, you will get a DC number from the Department of Corrections. And then the next time that you're picked up, there is a very good chance that that is going to trigger other classifications, which are regulated by our career criminal statutes. And I had years of experience in that specialized units. And I mainly dealt with armed robbers who had been released from prison after doing significant bids. And then within a close amount of time, it's generally three years, you are now considered a prison releasee reoffender if you have now committed a violent offense. And if it's a robbery, the mandatory minimum is life in prison. So that is the difference between a Dade County jail and an actual prison term. So the difference is, it's a lot of people that end up going to jail or going to prison because they can't pay for an attorney and they end up with a public defender that got a thousand cases, that can't do the research, that can't do the legwork, and they end up taking plea bargains. You know, it's a lot of people in jail and prison ain't done nothing but because they don't have the resources, mm -hmm. they have someone telling them, look, either take this year in a day, or if you found guilty, you're going to get 30 years or life. And what you think they're going to do? Well, yeah, we've heard this story yeah. over and over. The people that get the offer to sign, you know, we had a show with yeah. Gloria Taylor, two ounces of cocaine, she's doing life in prison. Um, and think about my two cases, what I just talked to you all about. I didn't, wasn't convicted of neither one of them, but that was the conversation at the governor's office, at the clemency yeah. hearing. Yeah, yeah. Neither one was I convicted of. But then the question is, well, what do you do? Do you try every single case? It's not possible. It's not possible. So on any given Monday, if you walk into one of the felony divisions downtown Miami, I mean, you may have 100 cases that are on the docket, and they can range anywhere from a simple coke possession to a homicide. And, you know, clearly the... More severe crimes, those are the ones that are going to trial because you're looking at life in prison. But, you know, there has to be some type of punitive punishment because that's what it is for a crime that's committed. And I'm, and I'm not disregarding the fact that there are many innocent people who walk into court on a Monday morning. But from a judicial standpoint, what do you do? What you do, use some common sense. And... Uh, I always get back to the actual crux of, of what we're doing here. What are we doing? Like, are, are we trying to make society better, right? And you, and you look at our criminal justice system, uh, you, you talked very in, in some very detailed language about the, the guts of it. But uh, again, what are you doing here in terms of making the community safer? Are you, are you making people's lives better? Or are you making, making them worse? And I think in a lot of ways, the, the system as it's constructed, our current laws that are on the books, actually make life worse for, for, for individuals. They don't decrease crime. They don't decrease drug use. They don't improve mortality. They, they don't do any of, any of those things except you have this big, complicated mass of a uh, criminal justice system where everybody works and everybody knows the lingo, but at the end of the day, the outcomes are shitty, meaning that you're, you're not actually improving people's lives, but you, know, you, you have people who are working and engaging in the system and you know a lot of people are doing important things but at the end of the day it's not really accomplishing its goal which it, which again is uh, to actually help society and and that's really what I always want to get to the crux of because a lot of times we get so caught up in the weeds that we forget that uh, the, the criminal justice system is supposed to serve a purpose which it does not yeah I mean again there's crime out there we see it you've seen plenty of it I'm sure Denise but um what, what I'm curious to know is when the prosecutor's office walks in on any given Monday and they see the hundred cases from over the weekend, um, how, how do you guys process and collate that? And, and like Bernard was saying, do you just say, okay, well, look, these 25 cases, 
go go make a plea deal. Uh, these have to go to trial. These have to go. How do you break that down? And and where do you actually get the offer? Do you just pull the offer out of your hat? Is there a chart? How do, how do you say, okay, look, you, you take a year for this, and you over here, you take five years for this, and you, you, you can go home. I mean, is it based on uh, if they have a good lawyer? Is it based on the color of their skin? Is it based on their economic level? Is it based on because... You're limited. Uh, I mean, look, yeah. look what you have to work with. I mean, there is no formula. It's not like you just you know punch a bunch of things into the calculator and then it regurgitates what type of a range. So any time that anyone is arrested in the state of Florida, they go through an arraignment process. First, they go to bond hearings where a judge has to review if there's probable cause. And then from there, there's generally a 21 to 30-day window. Okay, now arraignment. What is the actual – What we've hear, I've heard that word before, but – Tell us what that actually means, the arraignment hearing. Okay, so an arraignment is set if you're in custody generally 21 days from the date of the arrest. And that is the time where the prosecutor can make a decision as to to file charges, if they're going to file charges, what charges, or if they're going to reduce charges, or if they're going to take no further action, which means that they're going to dismiss the case. And then generally, as a matter of course, the defendant will always enter a plea of not guilty. And then it will be set at some date in the future. And then it kind of triggers the discovery phase. There's an exchange of the police reports, the list of witnesses, and then the depositions ensue. Does this happen with public defenders? If I have a public defender, am I getting the same, like, he's going to go do discovery for me? He's going to get expert witnesses for me? Absolutely. And, you know... I, okay. I know that Mr. Jones feels a certain way, and there are people out there that think, well, like, oh, if I have a public defender, I am not going to be getting the same representation. I have to tell you that based on my experience, some of the finest lawyers on the other end have come from the public defender's office or have come from regional counsel who do all the cases that the PD's office has a conflict on because every day they're in the trenches. The difference between a private defense lawyer and an actual PD is PD's going to court every day, day in, day out. They know the tricks. They know the players. They know how to expose cases. Whereas if a private criminal defense lawyer is in trial, they're losing money. It's not a good money decision. And I have had many of my friends that have gone on to be criminal defense lawyers, and they say, I don't feel like a lawyer anymore because they're not in court. They're out there just hustling and trying to make money because it's a business. Where the PD, they're going to go to trial, and they're not afraid, and that's why they join the office, and that's why the finest lawyers come from the public defender's office in Miami. And I will swear by that. And I know people say it in the jail, like, well, I had a PD. Sometimes I would see a notice of appearance come in from whatever criminal defense lawyer, and I would kind of look at him and think, I feel bad for you because your PD was going to do better for you. Really? So, so, yeah. wow. so. But the, it, here's the thing. There's also the, the constraint of time, time limitation. So maybe the PD is a great guy, but how, do you, how does he process a hundred cases in a week. It's impossible. So they, how do you pick and choose which one you're going to focus on and be the great trial lawyer for, uh, you know, as a PD? Because doesn't, a, doesn't a, a public defender have to accept a certain amount? I mean, I've seen stories out there about public defenders being so incredibly overwhelmed that they just they can't get anything done. So if, if I can just say this, I, I, I don't recall saying anything about... PDs was bad. Right. So I've been involved with public defenders that done excellent jobs. I want to say that. But let's not shy away from the fact if you have money, you have a better opportunity. Those three, three things that you said, color, economics, and money plays a big role in who yeah. go to jail and who go to prison. Don't shy away from that. Because if you got money, you can buy time and you can do research if you don't have anything and you're sitting in jail, then you depending on that person that probably got 200 cases. Um, and I did not once, or am I saying, or am I looking down on the public defenders because I know how much work they got. Mm-hmm. But let's not, let, let's be real now. They got too much work to do. They don't have enough of so public like defenders. Well, yeah. right. So Denise, it's let, too me ask, now. let me ask you this. It, it, do you, do, as a, as a, the, the prosecutor's office, 
if I have a uh, fancy hotshot lawyer who's going to take and drag you guys through seven years of discovery, do you at one point say, you know what, not worth it. Next, let's let this guy go. Whereas if the public defender who's going to be in court every day, he's going to be there, he knows the game, he knows the players, is he going to drag you guys through seven years of discovery? Oh, they will. And yeah? they, and they okay. still do. They take those depositions. And at the end of the day, when you're sitting on that end, you need to do right by your client. And, you know, there's what the evidence proves. Mm -hmm. And then you got to look at it from your standpoint of what mitigation do I have or what weaknesses do they have in their case then then I can exploit in order to get a plea offer that is less than the guidelines. What is the best possible plea deal that I can get out of this situation? Because at the end of the day, there is something that you know 100% can happen to your client and that is to enter into some type of a plea deal, or you run the gamut by putting it in front of six people in Miami-Dade, and you never know. I mean, I've lost cases that I don't think I should have ever lost. And then I've won cases where I'm like, my, I, had a, I had one witness, and you know the jury felt that that was enough in order to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. You're really just running the gamut, and you're sitting there as a defense lawyer, and you literally have your client's future in your hands, and that is a great responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. I mean, I take my hat off to any people that work in the public sector. I, I think it's a very admirable thing, and uh, like you said, the attorneys that come from the public defender's office and from the prosecutor's office usually end up being excellent when they hit the private sector because of that experience. Um, in, in your opinion, Denise, what is the m number one shortcoming of the, the prosecutor's office? Number one shortcoming? <laughs> um, you know, doing it for, for eight years, you know, just like I was describing the responsibility that the public defender has. As a prosecutor, you have the same responsibility. If anything, you need to wear multiple hats. You need to, one, ensure that a crime was committed. And then number two, that the person who's been charged committed the crime. Um, and that is a great responsibility to bear. You know, you can walk out of cases, especially when it comes to homicide cases or even a DUI manslaughter that I tried several years ago involving a 26-year-old defendant who just didn't want to enter into any type of plea negotiations, and I had no choice but to try the case. He killed two people who were stopped at a red light, and his blood alcohol level was about twice over the legal limit. And, you know, it's it's one of those where, you know, he's no priors, comes from a great family, tight-knit family. So the verdict comes back, and he's found guilty. I have, you know, the next to kin on one side of the courtroom who lost two of their loved ones, and then I have this defendant's family who now has lost their son for at least 20 years. And then you walk out, and it's not a victory. Yeah. And that's what people right. need to understand, that you really do bear this responsibility, at least if you do the job right. And I know I do, or I did. And I remember leaving court that day with my trial partner and thinking like, hey, do we go have dinner? And I just kind of looked at her. I'm like, you know what? I'll see you on Monday. Yeah. You go home and you, you don't feel good. You feel good that justice was done, but then you ask yourself, like, what really is justice? Exactly. And that starts to wear on you. And doing it for eight years, it really takes its toll on you. Um, and I think that's what people need to understand. I think when you're a baby prosecutor and, you know, you try cases, you're like, great, I got my first conviction. You know, let's try more cases. But then you really need to be a human being and start to look at it from that other person's standpoint, that defendant who has now lost his life for a certain period of time, and then the collateral consequences that follow. That, those and are huge, a, yeah. It's a great yeah, the, burden. Yeah, the family, the family members, the friends, the community, sure. the, the, the co-workers, the, then when, if they get reintroduced back into society, you know, how does, how does that burden. function? No, it, 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 it but, has such an incredible ripple effect all of these things and, and the process, but you didn't answer my question. 
What is the number one shortcoming, do you think, of you're, the prosecutors? Of, is, it, is it that they're overloaded? Is it that they're, they— They're overworked. Okay. I, I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, you're talking about prosecutors that are starting at $40,000 a year gone through schooling, gone through law school, and they come out and, you know, they start in county court and they can have a whole gamut of cases from the simple battery to the DUI to the driving while license suspended, and they have 350 cases. And that, and what's the pressure for them? What's the pressure pushing them to push these cases through? Is it is it, the, is it this 21-day time period of the, of the the that they have to do the— uh, um, That's just the arraignment phase. The arraignment, yeah. Like once the charges are filed, you literally, as a baby prosecutor, can have 300 cases on your hand and then you have a judge who's looking at you and is barking at you like you need to get this done either you know you have a case and you're ready for trial or you have a plea deal or you can't meet the elements and you got to dismiss this so is the pressure due process is that what the pressure is it is but I think it really, at least in our county and I will speak on behalf of our county that it starts and it falls with the bench and, you know, there are judges who allow cases to languish in their division. That's a simple battery for three years. And then there are other judges who really hold attorneys' feet to the fire, and they ensure that justice is done. And that means, hey, prosecutor, you have the burden and the burden alone. Can you prove your case beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt? And if you can't, you can't. Yeah. You just got to walk away from it. And is that when you, as a prosecutor— are you allowed in the public? Uh, are you allowed to say on your own? Can you act unilaterally and say, you know what, this is done? Or do you have to go back to a committee at the office and say, hey, this one doesn't look like it's working out? How does that work? You know, there's always a chain of command. You're always going to have a supervisor. I don't think I ever, you know, walked into court and just dismissed a very serious case without speaking to someone. Okay. Um, you have a duty and a responsibility to, one, the state of Florida, and then, two, if it's a victim case, to talk to your victim about the shortcomings of your case and the fact that you can't prove it and you would rather not throw spaghetti on a wall and seize what sticks and that you have a duty to dismiss a case. So you generally want to give the proper people a heads up so then, you know, complaints aren't being made or you're not being shown out in the media. And I, and I think that is one thing that people need to take into account is the responsibility and the pressure you have coming from the media. How many times have you seen in the news or you've read an article about someone who was just arrested on some type of a crime and the first thing the Herald says, well, he was arrested six times and that case was dismissed for lack of prosecution. And then where does the finger get blamed? It gets blamed at the prosecution's office for not doing enough. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, one thing you brought up was, you know, not feeling good at the end of the day, even if you, you might have won a trial. But like, what, what are you really doing or winning. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a physician, right? So if I treat a patient, I'm helping them, right? They're getting better. And I feel good about myself because my patient is healthy. But as a prosecutor, I think a fundamental issue is that you're winning trials or, or something comes on your on your plate and you're doing uh, what you what you can do to enforce the law. But sometimes you're, you're enforcing laws that don't make any sense or, or laws that are, aren't really doing uh, to, uh, a service to society. I think sometimes uh, doing your job means you know doing things that you may not agree with. I'm curious. Um, is there? A, yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Is there? A, is there? Is there any mechanism in place with the prosecutor's office, with the judicial system within the state that looks at at those exact things, saying, you know what, this. This particular law might have been yeah. good in 1872, but it's not so great in, in 1992 or even maybe 2018. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> archaic laws. And, and you know, because you mentioned the minimum, minimum mandatories, and for those of you who don't know what that is, that means uh, Congress got together uh, in the 90s, I believe it was, and decided crime was so out of hand, we're going to make it so that if you do something, you, the judges are going to be bound to have to give somebody a minimum amount of time, and that's a mandatory order. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. That's a tool that a lot of people argue for that prosecutors can use at their, well, not necessarily at their discretion, but, but it leverages things. But can in the you favor change that if it's mandatory? I mean, do you even have an option? There's discretion. Yeah. There I mean, is. And the only people that can 
exercise that discretion it's is yours. the prosecutor's office. Yeah. And again, you know, you're you have cases that have mandatory minimum sentences, such as drug trafficking. Um, the midmans are a lot higher for trafficking pills than it is marijuana. And then you also have mandatory minimums with the use of a firearm during the commission of a felony. And then you have mid mandatory minimums as to violent crimes and also just repeat offenders. How do you feel about that? Do, do you think min- mandatory minimums actually help? That's or, actually a great yeah. question that I would like to hear everyone How around this table answer. Yeah. How do you feel about mandatory minimums? I mean, that, that's a loaded question. Why um, is it loaded? It's loaded because there are different facets as to when mandatory minimum sentences are exercised. But but you said that they have discretion. So clearly, if so, if I'm a judge, somebody walks into my courtroom and they had a, a, a dime bag of weed versus a guy that walks into my courtroom and has been accused of murdering five people, there's going to be some discretion involved. So there is – it's subjective. The whole thing is subjective, and you're telling us that it's subjective because the mandatory minimums – you're allowed to have discretion. You're allowed to have discretion, and this is why discovery is very important. Things look a certain way on paper, but once you start to scratch the surface, things may just evolve into something completely different. I understand that, but Florida and Nevada are the only two states that allow discovery. So what what happens with the rest of the country? I wish I knew. Yeah. Because they generally go to trial by ambush. Because all they have are police reports, but they really don't know the credibility of their star witness until they're on the stand. Trial or, you know, ambush. they had like an, an investigator go out and let's just say the witness talked to them. But that's it. Otherwise, you're trying at a trial. How do you feel, <laughs> so, Leroy, about mandatory minimums? So history has proven that um, mostly people of color and... and um, Hispanics have been the one who've been bearing the brunt of minimum mandatory. And a lot of the cases have been drug cases. And where you have the people who actually have have been importing or shipping it here, uh, only going to federal prison for a couple of years, you got somebody doing street level crime getting the minimum mandatory sentence. Mm-hmm. So I don't like the idea. I think discretion needs to be with the prosecutor's department and the judge. Mm-hmm. So the judge has some discretion as it relates to that, right? No, the judge has no None. discretion. The judge cannot waive a mandatory minimum sentence. And But this starts and falls with the legislator. This isn't something that just a prosecution's office right. came up with. Exactly. So if this we want to change this, law. this has to be done the at the legislative level. Absolutely. Yeah. So your senators and your congressmen, you need to get uh, in touch with them and say, hey, these are wrong. We'd like to see a change. That's, oh, what, yeah. that's what you need to do if you want to see so, this change. So if there. someone gets a man- minimum mandatory sentence and no case and never in the history have a judge sway from that? They can't. They have no discretion. The prosecutor yeah. mm-hmm. is the one with the discretion. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if the prosecutor says to the judge, you know what, you know what? This, this guy's not that bad. Take Come on, take it easy on him. The judge could say, okay, we're going to take it easy on him. Well, well, it depends. Like, there's an art. So, you know, let's say that the cops do a bust on a grow house and, you know, over 25 pounds of marijuana have been retrieved and someone's now charged in the trafficking. And let's say they don't have any priors and they generally don't because they come here from Cuba and there's a big guy on the top and he says, like, hey, you're going to go live in X house and I'm going to give you a $400 stipend every week and then they do the bust – and this guy is, you know, stuck with the bag, literally. Yeah. And now he's facing a three-year mandatory minimum sentence. <laughs> the court can't waive that. But the judge have to agree to it, right? No. No. If he was to plead guilty, he would have discretion to sentence him anywhere from the bottom, which is the three-year mandatory minimum, mm-hmm. upwards to 30 years. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Bernard, Sorry, so how you do know you feel, feel about the minimums? I, I, I think they're, it's, it's stupid. Um, I also think um, a lot of the laws that we have on the books are, are stupid. Um, so meaning that, uh, you know, the way we we deal with drugs, right, for instance, I mean, the, the entire concept of uh, legalizing drugs is, is just stupid, right? Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is decrease drug use. You want to improve lives. And, and we, we made it a, a legal issue, not, not a, a mental health or, or a health issue. Yeah. And the fact that we have this entire system built around that actually worsens people's lives 
and uh, burdens the judicial system with, with these nonviolent issues. And, and, you know, we really need to be focusing on the important things like getting rid of violent crime, uh, you know, people who are actually shooting each other. Things like that uh, need to be uh, emphasized rather than uh, these uh, drug crimes or even, even the mandatory, man, uh, mandatory minimums because at the end of the day, uh, I don't really think it's making society any safer. It's I think not, it, I think it's making people's lives a, a lot, lot more difficult. And we have, and, and we have a, a test society. case in this country with prohibition in, in, in the yeah. early part of last century, and it didn't work. It, yeah, it didn't work. did not work. Yeah. It didn't curb people's drinking, and it, once the uh, alcohol became legal, the, the prices for it went down, the violence around it went down, and you know. But I, mean, it's, uh, it's I guess really, as a, as a society. You know, th- this particular society has uh, very puritanical exactly. roots, yes. and I, I know that a lot of us have evolved past that. And one of the things that that comes up is you're talking about these grow houses. So yeah, some so marijuana use is legal now. Yeah, listen, uh, and then when it becomes legal, do they open the doors and let everybody out that had a marijuana charge? How's that yeah. going to work? Exactly. And the same thing, you know, don't get me started on on heroin and opiates because this major problem that happens that, that we've got right now on our hands in this country all started from a very um, legitimate place. Drug companies decided to, you know, hey, let's promote this. Doctors, well, very educated people, went and wrote these prescriptions, got a lot of people hooked. The prices got out of hand. The availability got out of hand. You need the fix. You go to the streets for a much cheaper, much easier bag of heroin, and then now it's got the fentanyl in it, and people are dying. And it, and it's a, and it, it is not a criminal problem. It is a major health issue. It is a public health crisis. Yes. But uh, that's a tangent. I yes. want to get back. Well, back, back to the, <laughs> the original, you know, question is yeah, it's it's you know, mandatory minimums are stupid, yeah. right? And and uh, a lot of the laws that we have in the books, uh, what we're doing here, is, in terms of what we actually do in society, is pretty pretty dumb. So, uh, yeah, but 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 it's a system that we have, and now obviously, you know, um, I, I just think if people were more informed about the big picture and took a step back and, and uh, understood, uh, you know, we're we're all in this together. We're, we're a society of of individuals that that uh, you know exist in a democracy. That we we would do a lot better if we actually use common sense uh, in in coming up with our, our laws and our criminal justice system. This is why it's important to to have some civic education yeah. and to know who you're voting for and where they stand and what they can do yeah. when they do get to the legislative level. Um, Denise was telling me a, an interesting story before we started this program today um, about the um, in the narcotics division. Back, uh, was it in the 80s, 90s? The no, TNT I mean, crew, you called it? 10 years ago. 10, Ten years, years ago. ago yeah. Narcotics, as far as the county, they had a very big unit. And then they had, you know, subunits. And one of them was the tactical narcotics team. And they would go out into... TNT. TNT. And they would go out into neighborhoods that are, you know, high crime, lots of violence. And you know where those areas are. It's Liberty City. It's Overtown. And, mm-hmm. you know, they would just set up operations where they're just, you know, doing eyeballs or doing takedowns of the buyers or doing takedowns of the sellers. And they used to saturate these areas and the arrest numbers were pretty significant. And then there was a backlash from our urban communities because they felt that they were being targeted a lot differently than white communities. And, you know, Joe and I were talking about it. They didn't do an operation like that in Pinecrest, but, you know, the bottom line is they really didn't have to. And now, you know, the big question is here is what do we do in areas where there is a lot of crime and there is a lot of violence? You know, the one thing we can't promote is lawlessness. We can't continue to have four and five-year-old little girls or little boys catching a stray bullet because there are turf wars in a community. So there needs to be balance with these communities being accepting of police coming in to do their job. But I understand that community relations are not what Whoa. they should be. Yeah, because so their most of their experience is with you know jump out boys yeah. coming at them instead of look. I know in an area in the Coral Gables or in uh, Pinecrest, the police drive through. They drive around. They they you know they do their rounds. Uh, maybe they jump out here and there, but it's not as it doesn't seem as. You said institutionalized, but, but it's unfortunate for the police to to have to deal with this this issue, right? Because at the end of the day, you, 
they the police come down, they crack down on these issues, and and they crack down on on the violence, right? But it doesn't fix the problem because the incentive structure is still there, right? You come, it's like whack a mole, and so at the end of the day, you have to decrease the incentives that lead to the behavior. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing right now is not working because we come in there, we 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 we, we you know bust everybody's balls or whatever, and lock people up, but it, it happens again. And I think things that uh, actually disincentivize this kind of behavior are what we need to focus on rather than just criminal, criminalizing uh, the behavior because at the end of the day, it doesn't help. Duly the, noted. The, the behavior is not being decreased. But, so but programs here's the thing. like here's the what thing. Rory's doing, I think, are more beneficial. They're absolutely more beneficial because there are no more or less drugs being done in no. Pinecrest or Coral Gables than are being done in Overtown or Liberty City. Um, and our solutions aren't helping. Th- there's the same amount of drugs. It's not, not like white people do more drugs or black people do more drugs than white people. It's, it's just not true. It's just not true. Yes. Um, and, and just st- statistically, it can't be because people of color are a smaller percentage of the community. Yep. But it seems that they are targeted and it is institutionalized. And I can see where this this whole perception of the police aren't here to help us. They're here to hurt us has grown from these kind of tactical teams that have been put into these neighborhoods. Because I guarantee you, you would have had a quick backlash if they had a tactical team over in Pinecrest. You would have had the quickest backlash you could imagine. True, but but, but there's a real alarming problem in these communities that you mentioned where, you know, the young kids are shooting each other, the drug use is rampant. A lot of gun violence. And something has to be done. My argument is just that, you know, these police, they're not not the solution, you know? I agree. So think about... In the inner city, in poor neighborhoods, um, you have a high um, presence of the police force. And if adding more polices would decrease crime, then why we're still having these incidents happening in poor neighborhoods? So it's no, it's no direct relations between having polices going to deter crime. It's no relations. Just look. It's a high concentration of police officers in poor neighborhoods. Why things are still happening? Is it because of the economic issues? Or is it economics? Yes, exactly. Because Education, right? economics. Education, socioeconomics, right. economics, yeah. yeah. So That's the I, ultimate I, question. The incentives are still there. And, and as a society, we, we, we've chosen to put more of an emphasis on criminal justice rather than the incentives that lead to the behavior. And so programs like yours, NANA, which uh, invest in, uh, it's a nonprofit, right, that invests in uh, small businesses, mm-hmm. I think are a much better solution and a much uh, uh, more fruitful target for our government to, to kind of invest in because you're, 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 you're empowering people to make money legally, right, without going to the streets. And then obviously that leads to all kinds of collateral benefits in, in terms of cooperative economics, improving the schools because of income taxes and, and how, how that's uh, doled out. But... The point I'm making is that um, I want you to, to, to definitely talk about more about the program, but we need to invest as a society in, in these kind of solutions rather than well, I, criminal I, justice. I think system. we need more communities in Dade County to be concerned with what's taking place in the inner city mm-hmm. other than the people that live in the inner city. Yeah. When you look at it, you know, the media paints, paints a picture. And by the way, the media only come in the inner city when something bad happens. So they don't come and show anything that any people in that neighborhood are doing a positive. They're only there when yeah. when some violent crime is yep. taking place. So that has yeah, an that, effect on the people. because that gets the ratings. Right, right. Yeah. So, and and then we don't, we don't hear the outcries for other community that's concerned about the gun violence that's taking place in the inner city. You know, if some of the people that, that, ha- that have a voice that's not of color or live in the inner city will speak out, I'm sure something will change. Look, these guys that's running around here with these AK-47s, they can't buy them. Who buying them for them? Who right. getting them from them? They yeah. can't. They definitely can't um, go buy them themselves. Yeah, don't don't get me started on yeah. gun laws and, and how you know? that, that's not really preventing uh, <laughs> yeah. the criminals from you know? getting guns. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's a whole not, another argument, but but yeah, I, I thank you for for elaborating on that because at the end of the day, uh, there are other solutions, and and we need to look at how we're going to improve communities of color or just poor communities in general with common sense policies common sense policies that, that invest in the community, like education and economics rather than Evidently, common sense is not that common. <laughs> yeah. um, Denise, let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask everybody this question. Have you ever experienced corruption within the 
within the criminal justice system uh, firsthand? Have you ever seen any corrupt acts taking place in during your during your tenure at the state attorney's office? No, I mean I've I've had those cases. I'm not going to target a you know a certain unit or type of law enforcement officer. But, you know, sometimes when you're on the streets for, you know, 25 years, you start to see things. So I think, you know, our police officers get a little disenfranchised themselves. So sometimes the ends justify the means. And if you, as a prosecutor, asking the right questions of your witnesses, you're able to see the inconsistencies in their statements. And it's not that, you know, a criminal act didn't occur, but the way it went down, very likely it happened a lot differently than what they're telling you. Um, I would say that's probably the number one problem as a prosecutor is once you start to like test your cases and bring your witnesses in, you learn that it's a lot different than the way it looks on paper. But as far as some systematic corruption, no. But you have seen corruption or is it easy enough to spot once you start asking the questions, you're like, you know what, this, this is not, this, these dots are not connecting. I wouldn't classify it as corruption because I just think about, you know, something completely different. Um, I would just say that people are, you know, not telling the truth and are a lot less credible than what you would want them to be. Okay. Have you ever experienced any corruption? So, growing up in Overtown in public housing in large my projects, we witnessed people become police officers in the city of Miami that wasn't from this country. That was, we don't know what kind of background they had. We don't know what they did in their country, but because they didn't have a history here, they was able to get on the police force. And in and, and the, the 80s is when the mass of drugs came into the inner city by people of authority that was not of this country that got on the police force and, and, and wreak havoc in some of these neighborhoods. But I, I don't want to shy away from that. You know, I mean, a lot of damage has been done. Look, in my case, when I talked about what happened with the police officer with the video, okay, videotape. That wasn't corruption where they, where they uh, uh, allegedly plotted uh, uh, a statement on, and, and by the way, when you get a, a, re, a arrest report, in most cases, you can't read it because it don't bleed through the other page. So the judge get to see it and the prosecutor get to see it in, in, his, in his form. But that person that got arrested, that taken it in jail, they can't read it because when they print it, it don't bleed through. So you don't know what you're being charged with other than what they said because you can't read what the statement was saying. I'm sure somewhere along the line you could get a clear yeah, copy. Yeah, but still, you should. But, you, uh, I'm mean, sure when you're in it, it's so different because just like anything, a hindsight is twenty twenty vision. Yeah, when who, you're living in the real moment in real time, but, it's a different world. But it, but who's going to ask for it? You're going to ask for it while you're sitting in jail. You already, in some cases, feeling intimidated. And 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 by the way, I, um, I think lawyers do get a better opportunity in the court than party defendants because look, you can go to any courthouse, and when court starts. Who cases I heard first? The paid lawyers. They get a chance to go right in front of the judge while the public defenders have to wait. Right? They do. And get I their agree cases with heard. You. Okay. So having money obviously pay play some. Well, they also have to advantage. be in multiple courtrooms. So it's just a matter of course that, you know, the PD is assigned to a certain division, so they're gonna be there all day and the private attorney comes in get their cases heard, they hop to another courtroom and they continue on throughout the morning or the PD can be there till 2, 3 in the afternoon because they got nowhere else to be other than assigned to that judge. And it's a grind them game. Right. That's, yeah, I mean, so it's just a matter of just business uh, courtesy. It is. Yeah. So scheduling. Yeah. So, yeah. So my, my answer to that question is, um, so I, I've never dealt with the criminal justice system at the level of either one of you. I mean, so basically, but I've dealt with them on, on behalf of my family uh, friends, and now uh, our artists and my mentees. And, and w what I've noticed is that the, the, the system is, is holding them back. And so right now we have them in a, a great program at FDF where we're actually moving them along the way in terms of improving their lives through all, all facets, education, economics, and actually you know jobs now. And um, because of their issues with, with the cops, they, they keep getting caught up in, into the, to the system. And um, 
the a lot a lot of times the cops are doing their job, right? And and they're dealing with a lot of gun violence and, and murders in the neighborhood, and so and so they're targeting certain people to, to to kind of not kind of but you know decrease what's going on, which is the active murders. But at the at the same time, they're 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 hurting them. They're they're, they're actually hurting what we're doing, and and in terms of trying to uh, improve their lives and and improve. Uh, their economic circumstances, they're, they're worsening it and decreasing opportunities and, and um, a, a lot of times uh, not, not on purpose, but sometimes on purpose. And so if from, from the perspective of the, our artists, the question is, is whether or not there's corrupt behavior, yes. From their, their perspective, yes. But from the perspective of that cop, seeing what, what they're seeing in the context that they're, they're dealing with these issues, uh, they, they may actually be doing a good thing. So at the end of the day, you're dealing with a system that that incentivizes these kind of interactions, you know, and 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 which a, where a community hates the cops because they're always fucking with them, yeah. right? And where, where, where cops actually, you know, have a, 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 a bad taste in their mouth from from the interaction they have with with the community, and and it's this negative feedback loop. And at the end of the day, we, we have to look at what we're doing because it, because it's really making things worse. Um, in a lot of ways, and it's making the, the job of the cops a lot more difficult they, because they can't relate to the people. They they don't relate you're to the people you're talking about somebody in a lot of ways. Twenty, thirty years old, never been in the inner city, now given a responsibility, told a gun, hey. and going in the public housing yeah. that don't know the people, don't relate, yeah. can't relate to the people. And, and there's a, there's a real fear there, and yeah. you know we you know we, we don't want to get off. So, topic too much. It is a, a real, recent yeah, murder. There is a real fear, uh, and I'm sure the, the fear home. is on both sides. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's a system. It's really a system. It is a system. Listen, and if you if anybody out there wants to make a change, the way that you got to make a change is you got to get involved. Um, that's you know why we do this program. That's why Felony Miami exists, so we can help to facilitate a change. So we can help bring ideas, thoughts, conversation, and maybe some kind of a technique to making a change because these changes only happen one way and that's by the community, society, the people that live here saying that's not cool, we need to change that. So voting is important. Educating yourself on what's going on in your community is important and getting involved is important because we all live here together no matter what color. We all live here together. You know, I, I think the important, when we talked about the me getting my rights restored, I think the most important thing that I took out of that is I imagine how many people that want to get their rights restored that cannot make that trip to Tallahassee because of whatever reason. Because either they're afraid or don't have the income mm -hmm. to go to Tallahassee to be that's heard. That's American. I know, and that's right. It yeah. should be. It, I there mean, should they be should satellite, have one in satellites. Every place. Of yeah. course, yeah. Uh, you know, and I knew based on being there all day. If you brought someone with you, if you got there, you had a better chance. Yeah. If you brought someone to speak on your behalf, you had a better chance. If you show that you were doing positive things since your last incarceration or release from supervision, Man. you had a better chance. And the fact right. that you have to do you that is, is is stupid. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. stupid. Right. That's un-American. You're, you're a citizen of the United States, and you should have the right to vote. And you hopefully know. that's going to change come November. Yeah. You know, yeah. so get out Ridiculous. there and vote because uh, I can't when vote somebody does, when somebody Amen pays for their, <laughs> yeah, somebody pays somebody pays their their debt. They they should be yeah. paid up. Yeah. Know, in the next case, okay. So we're going to wrap up this episode. Final question is a music question because that's one of the things that we do here. Okay. Okay. So music, recording artist or song. That changed your life. That's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> or, or impacted your life. Impacted your life. <laughs> change could just be like, I was happy. I heard this song. I got sad. Mm -hmm. That's a change. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a radical change. <laughs> it could be like, I was super sad. I heard this song, and now I'm happy. Yeah. Because I always say music is like a time machine. Right? We don't need to invent a time machine. It already exists. It's called music. Yep. <laughs> See, I don't know if I can point to one song. I can say that for myself, music has an ability 
to throw me back to 20 to 25 years where I know what breakup I was going through, what was going on in my home life, right what car I was driving, what street I was driving. It's like TLC, no scrubs comes on. And I remember <laughs> like cruising around, it's like windows down and you just, you feel right back in that moment. And it's I amazing, think right? that's the power of music. And it's just, it'll live through you for as long as you're on this earth. Yeah. TLC. There TLC. it is. All right. Leroy? I'm not sure. So, mm, I, I do know, I do know personally, I like Tupac music. I yeah. do like that. I like um, how intelligent I think he was. The way he uh, articulated himself. About Tupac. The change for poor people. I like that. Nice. But I like a genre of music, man. You know, I like the Rolling Stones. You know, I like um, Cindy Lauper. You know, yeah. Um, I like Duran Duran. All good artists. <laughs> All good stuff. You know? yes. So it's, it's you know. Shout out to the eighties. <laughs> right on. Oh, I have to answer Dr. the question. B. Yeah, you got to answer the oh, question, man. of course. Um, well, a lot of music impacted me, uh, in you know, in various ways. Um, alluding to what Denise mentioned earlier, but. Um, what comes to mind now is probably listening to N.W.A. as a, as a kid when uh, my brother was, was bumping them real hard. He was bumping them, DJ Quick, and that stuff in his car. And, uh, and that music was, was just, uh, for me, just opened, opened my eyes and it made me, uh, you know, look at things uh, differently, but also enjoy, like, the whole genre of hip-hop. And I, I started, like, quoting the lyrics and... And uh, and just just indulging in the music, and that that led me down a path to to looking at other hip hop, and I ended up in the New York hip hop and Wu Tang Clan and and all other genres. And and for me, uh, uh, it, it was kind of the gateway to to hip hop as a, an expression of, of of my youth. And so uh, I would get I guess you know N.W.A. would be uh, some some somebody that kind of put me on that path, um, or impacted my life in a, in a major way. Well, there you have it. All right. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming over here to the uh, Felony Miami Cambio Studios and airing it out with us. We really appreciate it for the entire team here at Felony Miami. Thanks for listening. I'm Joe Stone. We'll see you next time. Well, it's early,